Amen. Let, let's go before the Lord and let's pray, and then, uh, and then we'll dive in this morning. Lord, we love you, and um, Lord, we are just so humbled this morning by who you are. I thank you for the reminder, Lord, that our life really is indeed in your hands. And um, if the past six months have taught us nothing, it's taught us that life is unpredictable, that we can never see what's coming the next day. Lord, and I thank you that while the world might change around us, while our circumstances can shift underneath our feet so quickly, Lord, you still hold us in your hand. And I thank you for that. Lord, I pray we'll be reminded of that this morning. So, Lord, as we dive into your word, Lord, help us just together. We confess that we believe it's true, Lord, that your word says that the grass withers and the flowers fall, but your word endures forever. So your word has something to say to us this morning, and I pray that we would humbly approach it as so. Lord, may we be doers of the word and not just hearers. Lord, may you use me this morning to, to not stand in, up here in my own strength, but Lord, help me just communicate what your word has so clearly already spoken. And Lord, help us to just love you more and honor you as we walk away from this place together. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. Um, I, I need to confess something to you this morning before we begin. Um, Rick Brown is sitting down here on the front row, and he will amen me as soon as I say this. Um, I'm really weird. Like, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a weird guy. Is anyone just confident enough to say that you're weird, like that you're just different? Good. It's too, you know, it's too boring to be normal. You know what I'm saying? Um, it takes one to know one, doesn't it, Rick? You know what I'm saying? It just works. And um, I'm kind of weird. I'm kind of weird. And one of the ways that I'm weird is I find odd passages in the Bible encouraging for me. Um, now, I know and I'm well aware that there are several passages, numerous, like too many to count, passages in the Bible that are encouraging as soon as you read them. I mean, I think about Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I mean, how encouraging is that? Or uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, that the Lord has a plan and purpose for us, not to harm us, but to prosper us and for a future. Or R Romans chapter 8, where Paul says, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Like, yes and amen to all those passages. But I find some passage in the Bible that, Many would say it's kind of weird. I find those passages encouraging. Like, for example, don't judge me when I say this, but I find it encouraging when I read that David commits adultery of Bathsheba. And I find that encouraging because God is still faithful to David. God still uses David to accomplish his purposes. And I'm like, man, if David can mess up in such a major way, kind of gives me hope for when I mess up in my life. Right? I think about um, Romans chapter 7. Where, where Paul is at war with himself and he says, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I can't do it. And then I know what I'm not supposed to do, but I, I just can't help myself from doing that. And I'm like, man, if the apostle Paul felt that way, it kind of encourages me when I feel that way a little bit. Or, or one more for you. I, I, I get encouraged when I think about Peter, when Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And Jesus commends him and it says, on you, Peter, will I build my church and in the next paragraph, what happens? Jesus starts talking about how he's going to die and suffer. And Peter's like, no, Lord, not you, never you. And Jesus rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan. I identify with that well because there's some moments that I follow Jesus really well. And then there's some moments when someone cuts me off on 74 that I don't follow Jesus so much as well, right? Like, like sometimes for me, following Jesus is not even a day-by-day -day thing. It's like a moment-by-moment -moment where I follow him really good before breakfast, and after breakfast, I'm like, who am I, right? I, I find those passages encouraging. And as I say that to say this, we get to Psalm 42 and Psalm 43, and it is one of those encouraging, weirdly encouraging passages for me. Because when we get to Psalm 42 and Psalm 43, I want you to imagine for a second that we are entering into a boxing match. We're, we're walking in, we're in the middle of the boxing rink, and we get there, and if you look to one corner to see who's fighting, you would see a five foot ten man, brown hair, blue eyes, about 185, and you would look at him and think, that guy is definitely losing. I mean, black eye, bloody nose, arms are bruised up. He is receiving about as much oxygen as he can possibly get. And you're looking at him and you're like, that is definitely the loser. But then the camera pans over to his opponent. And to your shock, what you see is a man who clocks in at about 5'10", 185, brown hair, blue eyes, black eye, bloody nose, bruised up arms. And what's perplexing to you is you're looking at a man who is fighting against himself. 
And if you can get that picture in your head, that is exactly what we are entering into at Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. It's a man who is at war with himself. And this war that is raging within him is centered around this problem for himself. What he feels does not match up with what he knows. What, what he feels in his soul, in his gut, and in his emotions does not match up with what he knows. See, he knows in this passage that God is his God. He knows it. He knows, as we're going to read, that God is his salvation. He knows that God is his rock. He knows that God is his joy. He knows all these things to be true. But the problem is when you read this psalm, he is at war within himself because he's not feeling as if any of those things are true. And what he knows about God to be true does not match up with how he feels. And I just got to be honest. I came to be honest with you this morning. I identify with that psalmist really well. I remember looking back to me growing up here in this church. My family sat in the balcony right up there. What's up, Mr. Kevin? We sat right in the row behind him, third row from the left or from the right right there. And um, every single week we sat there. And there were some moments that I would be here, and I was feeling it. You know those mornings where you just, you just, I mean, the song was hitting right, the vocalists were perfect, right? And I walked in and, man, just had the goosebumps, no problem lifting my hands, no problem raising my voice. Preacher Mike was preaching, and I was just hanging on every single word, and I was feeling it. But then the next week would come, same seat, same music, same singers, same preacher, and I'd be like, I'm not feeling anything right now. No, no goosebumps, no frankly, no even temptation to raise my hand, no even thought to really sing real loud because I just wasn't feeling it. And this is what drove me crazy was that problem was a much bigger problem for me than just on Sunday morning. Like I would get on Tuesday and I would open up God's word in a quiet time Tuesday. And man, I'd just be sitting at my desk reading the word and I would feel like that me and the Lord are having a conversation just like you and I are here right now. And it was amazing and it just refreshed my soul. And I walked away encouraged and like, man, I can't wait to get in the Bible tomorrow. And then I would get there the next day, open up the book and I would feel like I was just reading just any other book. Just me this morning? Just me? This drove me crazy because what I knew to be true about God was that God was a good God. God was an active God. He was actively involved in my life. He's always working. He's a loving God. He's a gracious God, a merciful God. I knew all these things to be true, but what drove me crazy was I did not always feel it. You feel that with me? And what I love this morning is when we enter into Psalm 42 and Psalm 43, that is exactly what this psalmist is feeling. What he knows to be true about God simply does not match up with what he's feeling inside of himself. So this morning is simple. This is a one-point sermon. We're going to answer one question. So we're going to be here a lot longer than just one question. But we're going to answer one question this morning. That's all we're going to ask. And the question is this. What do you and I do when what we feel does not match up with what we know. What do we do when what we feel does not match up with what we know? Now, I need to just let you know, this is a heavy psalm, okay? But I promise you, we're going somewhere with this, okay? I, I promise you. So just buckle up, let's, let's get into it a little bit, and I promise you, we're going somewhere at least a little happier than what that feels like, okay? I promise you. Psalm 42, let's read it and see what he says. He says, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Let's, let's stop right there for a moment. We're going to work our way through this whole psalm by the end of the day. But it does not take a Bible scholar to recognize immediately that this psalmist and the author here is not in the best of situations. 
doesn't take a Bible degree to see that. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've, I've had some difficult moments in my life. I mean, I, I've had some nights where I shed many tears. I've, I've had hard places, and I'm sure if you've lived longer than five seconds, you've had moments like that too. But just to be completely honest with you, I don't know if I've ever been so depressed and feeling so down that I would literally describe my pain as that my tears were my food. Did you catch that in verse 3? Now, I don't know if he doesn't have access to food. Maybe it's that he's feeling so depressed and he's feeling so dejected and down that maybe he's trying to eat food and he just can't keep it down. I don't know. But apparently the tears are flowing enough from his eyes that he's able to be sustained just by his tears. He says, my tears have been my food. And immediately what this does for me is it makes me rethink how I've often seen this psalm laid out and portrayed. And I don't mean to hate on this picture any, but have any of you ever seen a picture where it's a picture of a deer and on the bottom of it, it says Psalm 42.1, as the deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. I know the pictures that come to my mind is, is two different pictures. There's one where this deer is in like this lush meadow, right? And it's just this beautiful place and, and this just nice stream is flowing through the grass and there's a perfectly healthy deer, beautiful picture, stepping over this brook and just sipping up water. And at the bottom, you had Psalm 42.1. It was beautiful. Or I know another one that I've seen is this picture of a deer in a nice snowy forest and it's peaceful, not a care in the world. And the deer is just pawing at the ground and it has Psalm 42.1 right there at the bottom. I'm not trying to hate on it if you have that picture in your house this morning or not trying to hate on the artist that made that. But what I am saying is I think the psalmist is trying to get a little bit of a different picture in our mind. I think the picture that he's trying to get here is not this healthy deer that's in this lush green place. I mean, you think about it, where he's writing this psalm from, he's probably in a rocky terrain. He might even be in a cave as he's writing this. He's writing this in rocky terrain, and the picture that he probably wants us to get is the picture of a deer who is incredibly malnourished. The picture of a deer that as you're looking at it, you can count every single rib along its side. Its tongue is out gasping for water, and you look at it, and you're like, if that animal does not get water soon, it's going to collapse, and it's going to be dead. That's the picture he wants us to get as he says, just as that deer is longing for streams of water, so my soul is longing for you, God. He wants God that bad because he feels like if he does not get God soon, he might not make it. And can I tell you what makes this even worse for him? Is, did you notice verse 4? Did you notice what verse 4 said? What did it say? It said, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. What's making his current condition even worse is that he remembers a time when it was better. Think about that for a second. He doesn't feel God right now. And what's making it worse is he remembers a time when he could feel him. When he says, man, I used to have no problem worshiping God. I used to have no problem lifting up my voice and singing. In fact, he says, I even led people in worship, but now he doesn't feel that way. And I got to imagine with a room this size and an audience online, there's maybe some of you that can resonate with that because for years of your life, it was nothing to come in here and sing. It was nothing for you to come in here and lift your hands and worship and be ready to receive a word from God. But maybe the past few months for you, it's been difficult just to get into the building. And it's frustrating you. It's frustrating you because you remember a time when it wasn't like that. That's where he's at. He's kind of going a little bit crazy with himself, isn't he? I mean, he's, he's, he's just feeling so desperate and desolate. And, and what do you and I do when we kind of get to a crazy moment of our life? When, when I feel like I'm going crazy, I'm just going to be honest with you, and I hope you're honest with me. I talk to myself. Anybody here honest enough to say you talk to yourself often? Yeah, we're not crazy, right? <laughs> All the time. What, what does he do when he gets to this place? He begins to talk to himself. Look at what he says in verse 5. He says, why are you cast down, O oh, my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? You, can you sense the frustration just leaping off this page? Because he knows what's true about God. He can remember these times. He knows it's true, but it's almost like he's looking at his own self, taking a self-examination and asking his soul, why do you feel this way? Because you're not supposed to. 
but he still feels the way he does. But even when he feels that way, he knows what he's supposed to do. Look at what he says in verse 5. He says, hope in God. He, he's commanding himself. He's challenging himself. Hey, I know you don't feel it, but hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And it's there that I'm not going to lie. I kind of expect the psalm to get a little happier. You know, there's this uh, famous uh, a type of psalms that you read in the Bible are what's called a psalm of lament. That's L-A-M-E-N-T, psalms of lament. And, and what these psalms often do is they start off very, very similar to what we just read is it's literally this author who is pouring out his soul and pouring out his heart before God. And it's kind of depressing, to be honest with you. Like, it's really intense, and there's a lot of asking God questions, like, God, where are you and what are you doing and all these things. But oftentimes, not, not every time, but oftentimes in Psalms of Lament, there's a turn where the psalmist says something to the effect of, but God, I'm still going to praise you. But God, I'm still going to hope in you. God, God I'm still going to trust in you. And I'm not going to lie. When you read this for the first time, this is the moment where you kind of expect it to turn, don't you? I mean, it's been depressing the first four verses, but it gets here. He says, hope in God, and you almost just imagine him to break out in some kind of preachery moment and say, because God, you've been faithful in the past and you'll be faithful now. God, God, you led my ancestors through the wilderness with a fire by night and a cloud by day. God, you're going to lead me. You're going to save me. Like you're kind of expecting that to happen. But look at verse 6. My soul is cast down within me. <laughs> like you think it's going to turn. Nope. He's right back to where he started. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Miser. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All of your breakers and your waves have gone over me. Stop right there for just a second. Um, there is nothing more exhausting than being in the ocean and being pounded just by wave after wave after wave, isn't there? That, that's why, you know, when you go out in the ocean, you want to get past the waves, past the breakers a little bit so you can kind of just relax and enjoy it because you are no match for the ocean. Waves will just wear you out, and yet that's the picture he's painting for us. It feels like wave after wave after wave is just crashing against him, and it's leaving him exhausted. And did you see, I know this isn't like really fun stuff on Sunday morning, but did you see who he attributed the waves to? What what does he say in verse 7? He says, deep calls the deep at the roar of your water vaults, all your breakers and your waves. He's attributing how he's feeling to God allowing things to come into his life. It's pretty heavy, isn't it? Look at what he goes on to say. He says, day by day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go about mourning? Because of the oppression of the enemy. As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? You can cut the tension with a knife in this passage. Because did you notice, he knows what he's supposed to do. I mean, did you catch verse six when he says, my soul is downcast, therefore I remember you? I can't tell you how many times I've preached to our high school students and preached to to probably in here on Sunday mornings where if you're struggling with seeing God work in your present, look back on God's faithfulness in your past. I think that's pretty good preaching. I, I mean, I think that's a good tip. Like I think that's in the Bible, right? Where God says, remember what I did. And so if you're struggling in the present and you can't see God, look back on your past at how God's been faithful in your past. That's exactly what he tries to do in verse 6. But guess what? It don't work. It doesn't work. He's trying to remember, and yet he just, it doesn't help him feel any better. He knows what he's supposed to do. Catch this also. He knows what he's supposed to say. I mean, did you see how beautiful verse 8 is? Verse 8 on its own is incredible. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, the song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. That's a beautiful verse. He he knows he's supposed to say things like that. But then look at verse 9. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? See, the tension here is he knows what he's supposed to do. He knows what he's supposed to say. He knows who his God is. The problem is... He just doesn't feel it. He just doesn't feel it. Verse 10 is particularly agonizing to me as he said, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? 
That's the second time in the passage he's mentioned that people are asking him where his God is. He did it in verse 3, and he does it here in verse 10. Why is that question driving him nuts? Here's why I think it is. Because he can't answer them. They're asking him. Bro, you were following God this whole time, and God was blessing you, and God was good to you, and life seemed like it was going well, but now, like, bro, you're in a pretty bad spot. Like, life has not gone well for you. Where is your God? And it's driving him crazy because he doesn't feel like he can give them an accurate answer. And what do you do when you go crazy? You talk to yourself. Look at what he says in verse 11. Why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Same thing as verse five. He's trying to remind himself, this is what you're supposed to do. Quickly, let's look at chapter 43. You might be wondering why is Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 together? You'll see why in just a second. But let's read Psalm 43. He says, vindicate me, O God. And defend my cause against an ungodly nation. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? So send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. And then I will go to the altar of God. To God, my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. See, there's a big shift that happens between Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. In Psalm 42, he's really just pouring out his soul before God and before us. But in Psalm 43, he's really begging and pleading God to act on his behalf, isn't he? He's saying, God, would you come and defend me? God, would you come and vindicate me, clear my name? He says, God, would you send your light and send your truth to lead me and to guide me? It's an incredible prayer, but we know he's still battling with these feelings because of what he said in verse 2. He still does not understand why God has rejected him. But you know what I love, verse 4? It ends on a a pretty confident note, doesn't it? He says, then I will go. And when he says then, he's assuming that means God's going to answer him. He's assuming that means God's going to show up. And he says, when God shows up, he says, then I'm going to go to the altar. Then I'm going to worship, then get the lyre, get the guitar, get the music. Let's turn it up and let's sing and let's praise the Lord because when God answers me, I'm going to praise him unlike I've ever praised him before. And there's a part of me that wishes the psalm would end there. There's a part of me because that would be a good final ending, right? Like, God, you're going to answer me when you do, then I'm going to praise you. But what does he say in verse 5? He's still a little crazy. What's he say? Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Now I know what some of you might be thinking. Some of you have been in church for a long time. And you've seen a ton of you know, guest preachers on Sunday. One thing I love about preachers is he's here a lot. Right? I love that. Um, but you've seen a lot of guest preachers, you know. And some of you might be tempted to come down and see me afterwards and be like, well, Pastor Justin, listen here. That was an okay sermon. But here's what you need to know about being a guest preacher. When you're a guest preacher, you're supposed to preach something happy. Like pick something encouraging. Pick something, you know, makes us smile, laugh a little bit. Pick something that's going to lift our spirits, make us happy. Don't come in here preaching something about what do you do when what you feel doesn't match up with what you know. And I get that, maybe. And i got to be honest with you, this was the weirdest Sunday morning for me because the other times I've had the opportunity to preach here, I felt like it was so clear where the Lord wanted me to be. And I ran from Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. I wanted to preach Romans 7, I'll be honest with you. I wanted to be there, and I just could not get away from this. Because you know what i got to believe in a room this size? Is there are some of you that you have been dealing with that. You have been struggling because your hope is in God. You're trusting in God. You know that God is true. You know that God is real. God's working in your life. But you're not feeling it at all. And the enemy is using your lack of feeling to cripple you. Because how can you be a good Christian and not get goosebumps when we sing, no matter what may come my way, my life is in your hands? How can you be a good Christian and not feel like getting up and getting in the word every single day? And some of you this morning... 
It might just be a breath of fresh air and a sense of God's grace to know that the Holy Spirit inspired a man to write two chapters of the Bible who was struggling because what he felt did not match up with what he knew. That encourages me because I've been there. And this guy who wrote the Bible is there this morning too. But I don't want to just leave us with that and say, you're not alone, sweet. We need to answer the question. We need to answer the question that we started off with. What do we do when what we feel does not match up with what we know? And praise the Lord, I think the psalmist answers us three times in these two chapters. I think he gives us three answers in these two chapters. He does it in Psalm 42, verse 5, Psalm 42, verse 11, and Psalm 43, verse 5. What do you do when what you feel does not match up with what we know? I think the psalmist would look at us and he would tell us this. Put your hope in God. I don't have a way to make it sound any better than that. What what do you do when what you feel does not match up with what you know? You, You make the decision. You determine, I am putting my hope in God. Can I just tell you, public service announcement, you'll you'll probably know this if you're older in this room, you'll you'll understand this. Your feelings are a terrible compass to follow. I know I I told the nine o'clock service, um, we don't use compasses anymore. Your feelings are a terrible GPS to follow, right? They're terrible. I've heard people tell high school students, hey man, just follow your heart. Hold up. Jeremiah 17 verse nine says, the heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. That's awful advice. And I get, listen, I I get that that is so, maybe you're just checking in today and you're just new or you're checking in online. I get that that is a very countercultural message to our world because our world says if it makes you feel good, pursue it. Whatever whatever feels right, right? Whatever is just objectively to you, whatever feels good, do it and pursue that. And I'm just here to tell you, your feelings are a terrible compass to follow. They will betray you so, so fast. Can I prove it to you this morning? Um, I love, I love, I love, I love Zaxby's. I love Zaxby's. Right? I love Chick-fil-A 70% of the time. Zaxby's gets my other 30%. And, and I'm the same guy. I'm the guy when I go to a restaurant, I get the same thing if I like it. I'm not really dabbling in other areas of the menu. If I know what I want, I'm getting what I want, right? And uh, so when I go to Zaxby's, I get just about the same thing every time. I get the wings and things combo. Boneless wings with um, wimpy sauce. <laughs> and, yeah. I asked the guy one time, I got, I got time. I asked the guy one time, I said, uh, I, I tried to order it just mild sauce. That's what it is, right? I said, can I get the wings and things combo with mild sauce? And he says, uh, you mean wimpy? And I'm like, bro, I wonder if you could sue, sue Zaxby's for making me feel bad. Um, sorry, maybe you could, I don't know. But I get the wimpy sauce. Extra fries, sweet tea, and then here's the kicker. Ready? Normally, the wings and things comes with a ranch and a Zach sauce. I get two Zach sauces instead of ranch. Okay? I'm convinced Zach sauce is going to be in heaven some way, somehow. Like, it is, it is amazing. It is incredible. It's, it's just the bomb. Ranch will not be. Okay? <laughs> you can determine where that is for you. I don't know. But Zach sauce is, is amazing, right? So when I order, I get the wings and things, boneless, wimpy, fries, Extra Zach sauce instead of ranch. So one day, um, I was in Anderson University. That's where I went to school at, to college. And it was a Sunday morning. I went to Concord Baptist Church in the morning. And uh, I left church, and the Panthers were coming on at 1. And it was pr- just enough time to swing through Zaxby's, get my food, and get back to my dorm before the Panthers came on. And y'all, I'm just letting you know, that's a good Sunday afternoon for me. Like, that is, that's all I need. Me and now I got my wife. We can watch Panthers together. Uh, but at the time, I was like, this is awesome, right? And, um, and so I go to Zaxby's, get in the drive through and I order wings and things combo, boneless wings, wimpy sauce, fries, sweet tea, and I said, I want two Zach sauces instead of ranch. Simple enough. Pulled around, paid the man, took my food, and I didn't check. <laughs> didn't check, right? Because I trust the guy, right? He works his ass, he's a good man. So I, <laughs> I take the food, take the food, I get home, uh, back to my dorm, I, I get ready, I throw my Cam Newton jersey. No, I've still not gotten over it yet. Uh, I get my Cam Newton jersey on, pull, the, pull my Zaxby's right there in front of the TV because that's how I roll on game days, right? I'm so pumped. Turn the TV on right at 1 o'clock. I mean, I'm ready to go. Nothing can get me down until I open up my container of chicken. And what I saw, I saw chicken fingers. I saw wimpy wings. I saw the fries and I had my sweet tea, but to my shock, 
two ranches. <laughs> I specifically said, I said, man, I said, I want an extra Zach sauce instead of ranch. And somehow the enemy was working against me that day. And he gives me two ranches instead of Zach sauce. I kid you not, you're going to judge me, but I don't care. I could have taken that box of chicken and flipped it up against the wall. I went from being so happy to so mad. And don't judge me because you have little things in your life that make you so mad too, don't you? It might not be chicken finger sauce, but it's something. It's something. So listen, listen, if you get that, listen to me. My feelings can be affected by the sauce that goes on a chicken tender. So, so hold up. Listen to me. Why on earth? Why on earth would I let the same feelings that be, can, can, can be affected by something so small determine where I place my hope? Why? why? We, we do this all the time, don't we? See, see what I've determined, and I, this, is, this is the point right here. If you're taking notes, this is it. Where we place our hope, where we place our hope is a decision that we make. It is not necessarily a feeling that we enjoy. Where we place our hope, because I love, I was talking to Steve Strickland about this the other week. Um, you're going to place your hope somewhere. You with me? You're going to place it somewhere. It might be family. It might be your job. It might be your finances. It might be kids. It might be education. You are going to place it somewhere. I'm just encouraging us this morning. Let's determine that we're going to place it in the right place. Whether we feel it or not, let us place our hope in God. Where we place our hope, it is a decision that we make, not necessarily a feeling that we enjoy. Because I just got to be honest with you. I love it when I feel it. Anybody else? I, I got to love it. I love it when I'm worshiping it, man. It's just like, it's like just no problem lifting my hands. No problem shouting. No problem saying amen during the sermon. No, I love it when I feel it. But you know what I had to come to realize when I was in high school and, and growing up? God is still God whether I feel it or not. Like, I'm just here to tell you, and I, I'm not hating on you this morning. I'm just telling you, if you didn't feel like singing this morning, he's still worthy of you singing whether you felt it or not. He, he's still worthy of my obedience whether I feel like doing it or not. Like, God has to transcend our feelings at some point, doesn't he? Doesn't he? So I'm just here to tell you, we may feel it sometimes, and that's great. But I want to be like this psalmist here. That when the circumstances of my life are shaky, when, when my feelings may be going this way and that way, I want my hope to be steady. Where I determine that where I place my hope is not necessarily a feeling I enjoy, but I can decide to place my hope. And I want to place it, as Matthew said earlier, in the God who has the whole world in his hands. Because you know what I love is that God has not left us alone in this life. We obviously have the comfort of the Holy Spirit, but we have his word, this, this perfect, infallible, inerrant word of God. Because God wants us to know some things despite what we feel. That when my feelings are shifty, I can run to what God has said is true. I, you know, you might feel this morning like God is not with you. Things might be coming up against you in your life, and it might be the craziest six months of whatever. I, I don't know, but it feels like everything is against you and nothing is for you. But Deuteronomy 31 says that God would never leave you nor forsake you. His word's true whether I feel it or not, amen? You might not feel like God is hearing your prayers. Or maybe even this, you might not feel like God wants to hear your prayers. But 1 Peter 5, 8, God invites us to cast all of our cares upon him. And 1 John 5, 15 confirms that he hears every single one of them. You might feel like your life has no purpose right now. And you might be wondering, man, where is this thing going? Why am I even here? Why did I even tune in? But Psalm 138 says that the Lord will fulfill his purposes for me. So good. You might not feel like God is meeting your needs right now. Might I remind you, you got here this morning. You got clothes on your back this morning. But let me remind you from the word, what does Matthew chapter 6 say? Jesus is looking at his disciples and looking at people and says, if, if your heavenly father provides for the birds of the sky and the grass of the fields, how much more will he provide for his children? He'll meet your needs. You might feel insignificant compared to the people around you 
who seem to have it all together on the internet, right? Because it's really easy to make it look like I have life figured out on social media. Have you figured that out yet? Yeah. It's crazy how everyone else has everything going great and my life's falling apart. No, their life's falling apart too. They're just better at editing pictures. That was a high school, that was a high school pastor in me, sorry. But you might feel like you're insignificant. You might feel like that. But Psalm 139 says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. These are my favorite. You might feel unworthy. You might feel like you're here alone this morning. But can I remind you that 1 Peter chapter 1 says that God bought you. And you have been bought not with perishable things like silver or gold. I think silver and gold is kind of great. But he says, you've been bought not with perishable things like silver and gold, but you've been bought and paid for with the precious blood of Christ. Don't let anyone tell you you're not worth something. You might feel hopeless. Talking to so many students and so many people, that's what seems to be the anthem of the last six months. It's just a feeling of hopelessness, like there's victory nowhere in sight. But let me remind you, that's probably how the disciples felt on Saturday. And Sunday changed that feeling a little bit, didn't it? That the word says that we have a living hope. That even when death is staring you straight in the eyes, when you feel like it's closing in, the word says we have hope. I could go on and on, but Christian, here's how I leave you this morning. When what you feel does not match up with what you know, put your hope in God, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the Alpha, the Omega, the one who's holding all of this in his hands, and in First Col- as Colossians 1 says, who is sustaining all things, put your hope in God. Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for your word this morning. And Lord, I thank you that your word is just, frankly, that it's just real with us. Lord, I thank you that you inspired a man to to write two chapters of our Bible where he is struggling with something that I feel like many of us oftentimes can struggle with. Where we know what's true about you, we know who you are, but Lord, our feelings don't always back that up. Lord, help us to just be reminded today that our feelings are a terrible compass to follow. Lord, you are still God whether we feel it or not. You are still on your throne whether we feel it or not. You are still working all things together for good, for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purposes whether we feel it or not. Our sin debt has been paid whether we feel it or not. The tomb is still empty, whether we feel it or not. Lord, help us to place our hope in you. I pray that you would encourage believers in this room who have been dictated and led by their feelings for far too long. Lord, I I thank you for when we do feel you. you. You gave us emotions. You gave us that, absolutely. But Lord, help us determine to place our hope in you, regardless of the temptations of our feelings. May we put our hope in you. Would I pray if there's someone here today that's never begun to follow you and maybe because they're waiting on this big magic feeling moment, I don't know, but Lord, I pray right now, would you just speak to them? Holy Spirit, would you draw them under your son, or under the son? Would I pray that you would do that? Would I pray that we realize that, that they need to follow you today? Would I pray for everyone in this room? May we put our hope in you. And what we feel does not match up with what we know. May we determine and we determine where our hope's going to be. We love you and we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.